part to themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have the higher, more lofty portion of their soul. And w- as faith leaders, we have to give peace a fighting chance. And so, you know, initiatives like this are very refreshing and they remind us of the call of God. This is the call of God. The call of God is not for us to uh, divide and then distance ourselves from one another and then create echo chambers. No, God calls us to confront our internal biases. If we did not confront our internal biases, we would not have the success of the civil rights movement in America. Uh, and, And if we did not confront our internal biases, we would not be able to be at the side of the innocent Jews who were massacred in the Holocaust. We would not be able to propagate all the teachings to bring awareness to their cause as well. So all of this requires for us to appeal to the sense that there's a spark of goodness in every individual. And this is what these are these initiatives are about. So thank you so much for having me. I also do want to apologize for being late. As you all know, you know, this is a very, very difficult time. And every day, and I'm sure maybe, you know, we can all relate. Every day I wake up with a sense of duty. Like I have to do something, uh, you know, because these are our families. My mother in her origins is actually from uh, uh, her family tribe is originally from a place in Gaza called Shija'iyah. Shija'iyah. And, uh, and, and, you know, so when I hear almost on the daily, Shija'iyah was bombed, Shija'iyah, and you'll, you'll see it now that I said it to you, you'll see it now in the headlines, Shija'iyah, a certain area in Gaza is being bombarded. You know, it always tugs at me a certain way. Um, not to mention that in the West Bank, one of my relatives, I, I'm originally from the West Bank. My mother's family are refugees from Gaza that were expelled from Gaza in 1948 to a village in the West Bank. And uh, I, one of my relatives, anyways, in the West Bank, 37-year-old Rhonda Ajaj was, was murdered in cold blood. Uh, you know, Israel has military, literally Palestinians in the West Bank, let's put Gaza aside, are under military occupation. This means that they, w- they are allowed to tell you, you're not allowed to go on this highway after this time. And... We, we don't have the best technology. We don't always receive, uh, you know, notifications on our phone. The system's still rudimentary there. So people can mistakenly take the wrong highway. And because she went on the, she made a wrong turn, she was shot in her car while her son was in the back. And her son was injured and from the shock fainted. And he awakened to the, to the news that his mother was killed. My uncle lifted her body from the car. My mother's sister lifted her body from the car. And she's from our village. So I'm mentioning all this because I wake up every single day with a sense of duty. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer the call of these people who are asking me, look, we need an imam. We need a religious voice to speak at Heart Plaza. I'm going to try to answer the call of Dr. Timur. And I owe her, you know, a nice meal in Dearborn for being so late. Please forgive me for that. Okay. But, you know, that's, that's really the reason why. And so I, please forgive me for that. Uh, but in any case, to kind of give some context to the issue, listen, is the Israel is the the Israel Palestine issue, and I don't call it a conflict because I'm very meticulous with words. And the reason why I'm meticulous with words is because my father has a master's degree in applied linguistics, and he was very disciplinary and very strict about what words we utilized to describe certain phenomena in our lives. And when we say conflict, I'm just talking like there's a certain threshold of power that each party has to have in order for it to be called a conflict. If I got in the ring with Mike Tyson, that's not a conflict. That's me getting knocked out. That's all it is. And essentially, you're you're talking about a full-fledged, fully funded entity. That is the, the, the Israeli Zionist regime with a $30 billion Iron Dome. I'm speaking basic facts. Like for me, I want to raise the level of intellectual discourse. I I want us to talk like facts because I'm okay with changing my mind as long as it's the truth, no problem. But let's please talk facts. You're talking about one entity that has a $30 billion dome that receives receives to the tune of $10 million a day from our tax dollars. Like by force, no matter what, I'm a, I'm a tax paying citizen. My money definitely has paid for the bullets that killed my family overseas. Could you imagine how frustrating that is? So now we're talking about that entity. And then even if we're going to go as far as Gaza, because the West Bank has the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank has agreed to drop arms. 
They have an agreement called we will uh, with Israel saying we won't bear arms. We will only seek the route of diplomacy. The people in Gaza said we want to bear arms. Okay. We want to fight for This is our land. This is our claim. We want to bear arms. And they democratically elected Hamas the government. And with all of my disagreements with Hamas, because a lot of times they are doing things that are really contravening anything productive. Okay. Um, but given that this is the, the matter, um, it's hard for me to call it a conflict where in Gaza, even in Gaza, they are utilizing rudimentary materials with whatever they can get their hands on in order to, you know, uh, re uh, revolt or, you know, uh, uh, fight for their land, etc. Um, so, number one, in order for us to understand this conflict, we can't understand it on the basis of the narrative that we that has been pushed through the media. And clearly... There's a lot of turnaround these days. People are reading more. They're recognizing more. And not just on the Muslim side. So I want to say one thing about, is this a religious conflict? I would like to comment on this question for a second. Is this a religious conflict? The answer is no. It is not a battle between two religions. Uh, in fact, you know, history shows um, when Omar, who's what, who was the second caliph after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the second caliph. So it was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Abu Bakr. And then after Abu Bakr, uh, it, uh, for seven years, it was, uh, or no, two years, sorry, it was Abu, uh, Omar. The caliph Omar, he was known for his justice. And Saphronius, the leader of the Romans at the time, he said, we have in our scripture that we, uh, we would like to give the keys of Palestine to a man with the name, with three Arabic letters in his name. Ain, Mim, Ra, Amara, Amara, Omar. Omar, okay? So Omar came, and it's a long story. I won't delve too deep into it. But Omar came, and he gave him the keys. And Omar asked him, where is the site of the Christians? Okay? It was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that was present there. And they said, it is right here. He said, okay, where is the, the area for the, the Muslims? Okay? The Holy Aqsa Mosque. They said, it is there. They, they left the area for the Muslims and the Christians as a dump land and Interestingly enough, the Romans under Saphronius prohibited Jews from being anywhere remotely available in the, the, the vicinity. Jews were not allowed to enter. Omar, Caliph Omar, uh, may God have peace on his soul. He said, w w show me where the area for the Aqsa Mosque is. I would like to pray in it. He prayed in it. And they said, wait, why don't you go into the church instead of going to the dump land that we left the Muslim site as, okay, go to the church. Omar said, I refuse to pray in the church. And he said, why? They asked him why. He said, if I pray in the church, Muslims after me will think that this is a Muslim site. And it is within my interest to preserve the Christianhood of Palestine. Okay. And he asked Jewish leaders from around the vicinity that were expelled from Palestine to send tribes to live among the Muslims under Omar's rule, to procreate, to have children, to, ex to uh, increase their Jewish presence. So is this a religious conflict? No, history comes to contradict that and say, actually, when Muslims were in power, okay, they always advocated for the presence of Jews and Christians in, in, in the mosque. In the Quran, it says that certainly if it were not for the presence of mosques, temples, and churches, the, 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 the entire world would be misguided. So Islam is in the business of the preservation of the churches and the temples now and the synagogues. Now, at the same time, though, I want to address a certain element. Any cause of justice for me as a Muslim is motivated by my Islam. And any cause of justice is motivated for a Christian by their love for Jesus. And any cause of justice for a Jew is motivated for their love for Moses and for the teachings in the Torah and the Talmud. So essentially, why am I mentioning this? Because... Um, what, what happens is that we start to condemn people for being motivated by God to stand up for justice. Yes, if I quote my Quran, if I quote Quran to say, certainly the victory of God is near, certainly oppression does not last forever. God says this in the Holy Quran. I'm not quoting it to say, oh yeah, look where the Muslims versus the Jews. No, I'm quoting it because... 
This is my guiding light in addressing all of my affairs because Islam for me is a way of life. Christianity for the Christian is a way of life. It's not just remaining within the confines of the church on Sundays. It goes beyond those walls, uh, essentially. So this is also important to address. Now, of, of course, where, where does the religious element come? And I'm only addressing this because I think it's important for people to really, again, this is an appeal to the higher self, okay? Uh, many will refer to the idea that in order for the kingdom of God to be brought back, the Jews must all exist within the state of, of Israel and statehood must be created. Okay, if I, I have absolute respect for somebody who wants to adhere to their religion. Honestly, anybody, anybody who is godly and wants to adhere to their religion, I love that because I believe that we're tending towards a godless society, unfortunately. And morality is being shaken and uh, principles are also becoming very sullied in, uh, in, in, this, in this day and age. So, so my utmost respect for anybody who is trying to bring the kingdom of God uh, closer. However, my sentiment to them is we have a maxim in Islamic jurisprudence so Islamic jurisprudence, you, that's a fancy word for law, okay? Islamic law has maxims. So basically, Muslim scholars looked at God and his commands and looked at the commands of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they established a code for us to understand and to be able to establish analogy and conclusion, okay? Uh, through deductive reasoning. So one of the maxims is, الْوَسِيلَةُ الْخَبِيثَ لَن تُحَقِّقَ الْهَدَفَ النَّبِيلِ the corrupted means will never bring about the lofty goal. If I have a goal like bringing the kingdom of God, please, uh, this is my question. And I'm humble to the response from my fellow Christian brothers and sisters. Do we really believe that Jesus would sanction the murder of innocent civilians in Gaza in order to bring the kingdom of God back? Fine, believe that. But, but do you really believe, honestly, that Jesus would sanction this action? Okay, uh, uh, and, and, and what's very interesting to me is what we accept in assumption without any questioning. Like, for example, I, I was asked on an interview, what was your reaction to what happened on October 7th? Of course, I condemn the harm of innocent civilians. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, look, I'm an imam. I'm not like uh, ascribed to a political group. I'm, I, I'm with God and his messenger and all of his messengers. Peace be upon them all. Uh, what was your reaction? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be, on, peace be upon him, said, any innocent civilian, any anybody who harms an innocent civilian, I am far from them and they are far from me on the day of judgment. There you go. That's my reaction. But what's, uh, what's interesting to me is that they will say Israel has the unequivocal right to defend itself. Okay, fine. You want to believe that? Why is it that the only way to defend itself, okay, is to wipe out 8,000 people's lives. There are entire families in Gaza who, who they are completely wiped off the registry now. And look, don't take it from me. I, again, I'm a big fan of education. Can I please quote for all of you to read? You Answer the call of Jesus. Answer the call of Moses. Answer the call of Muhammad. I say this to Muslims too. Read. Read. The first revelation to Muhammad, peace be upon him, was read. Read. We are a people of, of literacy. Okay? Read what Elon Pape said uh, in, in, in the, the book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He's a Jewish historian. Oxford graduate. The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine was written by Elon Pape. Go read some or listen to some of the statements from Dr. Gabor Mate, who is a Holocaust survivor himself. And uh, he is a well-known, one of the foremost psychiatrists in the world on trauma. He said, take anything that Hamas did to, the, to, to Israel and multiply it by a thousand. And you would still not get the atrocities that Israel committed against the innocent civilians of Gaza. Go read for Gideon Levy, who's a Jewish pro-Palestinian political analyst. And go read what he wrote about Israeli Hasbara. Hasbara is propaganda. And he talks about, and he, he debunked, uh, he debunked all of the things that are mentioned about um, uh, regarding how Hamas or, or Gaza uses human shields. This is all, I'm talking about from an academic perspective, because look, the true arbiters of morality are the people of intellectuality. 
it starts from us. Once we propagate these ideals, even on, on the in intellectual forums and in public discourse or in initiatives like this, may God bless you for this, okay? It starts out with the, you know, the, the intellectual jargon, but then eventually it trickles down into the conversations on the dinner table and it really changes the way that people see the world. So it, I'm telling you, the reality is no, no, there Palestinians love life just like everybody else. We have the best food. We have the best weddings. We have the best dances. Our weddings, I brought some of my friends to our Palestinian weddings. They said, I've never, I've never seen a ceremony so lit in my life. This is the, their words, not mine. Okay. So Palestinians love life. There's no way that a Muslim woman or a, a Palestinian mother would sacrifice her child to go bomb them. So no, no, please guys, please. Stop thinking about this. Anybody who is sacrificing their life, their life for the past 75 years, it is arrogant to assume that people would sacrifice their life for the past 75 years without a right or without a claim to that land. No, they are the indigenous people. The Balfour Declaration itself says in the state of Palestine. Okay, my friend Khaled Tarani, and you guys should definitely have him one day. He says, my, my father's deed, okay, to his house, okay, is written in the English language, the Arabic language, and the Hebrew language, okay? So we, we cannot negate that there are people there that have been expelled from their homes. In 1948, 750,000 people were expelled from their homes. And now in Gaza today, and this is something that will be in history books that we all have to answer to God for, 1.4 million people were displaced for their, from their homes in Gaza now. What are we going to say in front of God? Come on. We're all godly people that call others to morality. We believe in accountability. There's no way that Jesus would sanction this. So I'm asking you all, please, can you look in the mirror and confront your internal biases? Israel has the right to defend itself, says the individual who is presented with new information on the daily but does not want to confront their internal bias. No, you. you the only thing you can do, if you want to know the best thing you can do, this is my ask as a Palestinian and as a human. Your brother, your human brother is asking you the greatest thing you can contribute to humanity is to confront your own bias. If the civil rights movement during the time of Martin Luther King Jr., if, the, if people would have confronted their internal biases, we would have reached this sooner and there would have been a lot less victims who had to be unfortunately subjugated to the humiliation that was slavery, the abomination that was slavery. So please, let's let's move this quickly. Let's move this faster. Let's call on each other. Let's uh, let, let's call to the lofty ideals of justice. I'm sorry, but there will never be peace if there isn't justice. You can't subjugate people. We are not animals. Come on, let, let's be psychologists for a second. Uh, you know, we do a lot of coaching as, as uh, faith leaders, right? C couples come to us seeking, you know, some level of counseling, not official counseling, of course. But what, what happens when you call, the, 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 what happens when you label one party, even if they're wrong, if you label them as an idiot, if you label them, at, they just become worse. What Israel has done is label the, in, all, the entire P Palestinian population as terrorists. I'm not a terrorist for wanting m my land. There have been attempts by Israeli settlers to come to my land, my village in Deir Jarir, in the area of Shurafa. The area of Shurafa, there were attempts. And by the way, look at this. There was an elderly man. Uh, his beard is long and gray and he held up in the face of the Israeli settler who was armed. Okay. He held up a slingshot with a rock. Okay, to defend his land. Again, uh, what what are the you know when the Palestinians peacefully protest, they are killed. They are killed. Go research Razan Najjar, R A Z A N. Okay, and her last name is Najjar, N A J J A R. Interestingly enough, her initials are what R N, and she was a nurse, and she was killed by the illegal Zionist regime. Razan Najjar. Why was she killed? Okay. Why is it that Ali Dawabsha, go research. Ali Dawabsha, I've seen him, seen him in my dreams. He was an 18-month-old boy in Hebron. Okay. An Israeli settler burned his home and the baby died from the burning. And the parents of the baby succumbed to their wounds shortly after, maybe a year later. They had to live a year after seeing their, burby, their baby burned to death 
and the Israeli settler is now walking the streets of Israel free. What, what, what does this do to somebody? And my question to this, Israel, you want peace? Okay, my question to you. Do you know that there are, you know how many orphans you created in Gaza? What do you think their reaction is going to be? What do you think you are doing? So please don't fall for the tropes. Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel's looking for peace. It's not true. It's not true. Israel's not looking for peace. Uh, by the way, Palestinians are not looking to wipe Jews off the planet. Muslims never were in the business of that. I, I already shared the examples from history. Okay. Actually, everything that Israel does is showing that Israel wants to wipe Palestinians off the, off, off the map. And right now they are engaging in negotiations with Egypt to negotiate that the Palestinians in Gaza now move from where? From Gaza to Sinai in Egypt. So now they had to be expelled. By the way, by the way, I want to tell you all something. 70% of the inhabitants of Gaza now are not originally from Gaza. They are from the areas in Palestine, the 750,000 that were expelled in 1948. Where do you think they went? They went to Gaza. So they already left from their original homes to Gaza. And now Israel's making negotiations to push them out to Egypt. So now analyze the actions of Israel. What are they trying to do? They're literally trying to push us out to the water, to the sea. Get out of, get out of there. We, and there are already comments on social media of Israelis saying, I can't wait for the resort we're going to build on in Gaza after they're all gone. This is what they're saying. We never wanted this. And by the way, for the record, and again, I'm an imam. I'm not ascribed to any political group. But Hamas themselves entered into negotiations with Israel accepting 1967 borders, even though the, all of Palestine is for Palestine. But they said, look, we're willing to accept this. Who pulled out at the last minute? Benjamin Netanyahu. Okay. So, you know, uh, and it's, you know, just there are so many accusations that are hurled that on the intellectual level, we all know are wrong, but we don't have the platform to share them. And so, you know, it's really not about the numbers. I'm about these types of gatherings. The protests are nice, but really these are the gatherings that uh, I think will uh, propagate the true narrative, you know, and it starts here and it will progress slowly. I'm not about hype and fast paced things. Let's be about the slow paced education and it will, it will make strides. That is my belief. And I said it here. You know, at the protest, I said uh, it is hypocritical to the teachings of Jesus to support uh, the illegal Zionist regime's actions in Palestine. And it is hypocritical to the teachings of Moses to support the, the actions of the illegal Zionist regime. And it is hypocritical to the teachings of Muhammad to harm innocent civilians and to, to agree with the actions also of the illegal Zionist regime. So that's that's our message. And God said in the Quran, and I leave you all with this. Certainly we have recorded in the Gospels and in the Bible and in all of the scriptures before the, the Quran that certainly only the righteous will inherit the earth. The righteous Christians and the righteous Jews and the righteous Muslims and the righteous people of morality and, and moral consciousness, they will inherit the earth. It will happen. There is no... You know, no empire. The French illegally tried to occupy Algeria. You all know this. Okay, this is history. The French were in Algeria for 132 years. <laughs> 1.5 million Algerians were killed. Innocent civilians. 1.5 million innocent civilian Algerians were killed. And 8,000 villages were burned and massacred and destroyed. But then at the end, what happened? History has a moral compass. History has a moral compass. And eventually the Algerians were able to restore their right to their land. The same thing happened with the Italians trying to occupy Libya and so, so, so on and so forth. With, with the West African slave trade, the Africans were subjugated to, with what they were subjugated to. And, and that we are still making strides, asking for reparations, ensuring, trying to ensure their rights as well, trying to erase this, this uh, racism that has plagued society today. All of these efforts, God is all powerful and all, over all things, all knowledgeable and things will come, uh, you know, back to their restored balance, hopefully. Amen. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Um, there were obviously so many things that stood out, but what is happening now? And we've, we've discussed this already. We discussed it yesterday as well is if we put it in, and I know everyone here is not from the United States. Um, so we've got Scotland, we've got 
Sister Pat, you're in Ireland, right? Oh. Are you in Canada? Canada, Canada, I'm sorry. Awesome. And then we have um, Sister Nicole who's in Canada. We've got people in other places here. But in the United States, if you've not heard of sundown towns, which is what people of African descent had to endure through the 70s, 1970s, we're talking about contemporary. I was born in 73. This was going on, okay? Where if you were not, they had sundown towns. And what they said on the signs is don't let the sun go down on you in this area, in this town. And they would say, don't let the sun go down on you inward in this town. And that's what he's it's trying to explain is happening right now. They have inflicted curfews and sundown towns basically yep. on the people of Palestine. This wow. is what they're living in. Um, he talked about the, the um, almost you get the idea of a rural area where people have their, their farming equipment, the things that they use on a day-to-day -day basis that they're trying to defend themselves. We have yep. people every single year who wait for Cinco de Mayo to go celebrate and have all of this alcohol, which they shouldn't be having anyway, but that's a whole other discussion. They go and they have all of these things and celebrate and don't understand what they're celebrating. What they're celebrating is that on the 5th of May, um, years and years ago, obviously, we had the, they had the French in Mexico go into the farming areas, into the rural areas, and those people defended themselves with their um, shovels and their pitchforks and the things that they used to um, farm their land. That's what they had to defend themselves with. And President Juarez, who was the president at that time in Mexico, um, got word to Abraham Lincoln that the French were coming to the South to do the same thing, to take over the South. So you have all of these people that live in this racism and live in this hatred who are not only celebrating Cinco de Mayo, but don't realize that they would not have their South and Confederate flags and their ignorance to be able to celebrate if it weren't for President Juarez. And so all of this happens from a miscommunication and a failure to sit down and talk to each other, not at each other, and to dispel all of these stereotypes about different groups of people. But this is what's going on right now in Palestine that Imam just shared with you. They're trying to defend themselves with their farming equipment, with rocks. And you've got a, a, a large mass in many different countries that are saying that they're all terrorists. And this was really the purpose because I saw, and again, being from Detroit and having such a large Arab descended population, I saw in that area what happened after 911, how the, the um, Arab descended people were um, just, just ostracized in so many different ways. And there was no way as an African descended person that I could sit there and uphold that when I know that I go through that every day and our people have been going through that every day. When you have empathy and you uh, and, and that's just understanding for other groups, you want to listen. You don't want to throw people into a group because like I said last night, when you get to that point, then the next step is dehumanization. And when you dehumanize a group, then it is very easy to abuse, to torture, to do all the things that you can to them to show that you're better. And that's what it's about. We're in control. We're better. And no one group is better than another. That's why I wanted, um, I asked for, I called Imad, um, Imad and asked for, um, someone to speak. And I'm so glad that he was able to refer me to Imam Iran, Imran because we need this information. We need this history. We need to understand that we are all brothers and sisters. When it comes to um, the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, we are all, the, we, we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And so we want to make sure that we understand that we're brothers and sisters, amen? No, yeah, we have different faiths, right? But we have, what we have in common is that we want to be okay. We want our families to be okay. We want our children to be okay. We want to live a happy life. We're the same, all right? We have the same skin. Somebody pinches us, we're all going to hurt, right? 
We have to focus on our commonalities and stop trying to focus on our differences and recognize right is right and wrong is wrong. Tomorrow when we watch Farha and we understand um, what went on at the, um, the Nakba, and that was that 1948 displacement of the Palestinians from their homeland, then we can better understand what Imam is speaking about today, that it is still going on because they have a right to their land and there's another group that feels like they have a right to that land. But when we go back, you can it's as simple as going back and looking at biblical maps. That's really what it's as simple as. And you can see what happened. It was King David who separated the land. It wasn't God, it was King David, you know, and we have to look at what happened, um, what humans did and what was godly. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are some things that, that it's just humans did it and we follow it by law to put it in a, a simply a plain Christian perspective that we can all understand. We have people who swear that the King James Bible is the only Bible that's the truth. That's the only, and we know that it's, it's a translation. That is the only translation that's real. When you research King James, you understand that it was out of arrogance. He just wanted his name on a Bible like Nimrod. Let's go make a name for ourselves throughout history. That's what he did. So there are some things that are just done by man that we take as, as law. So when we as Christians hear oh, the Israelis are doing what they're supposed to do because they're God's people. It's like I said to you last night, okay? And I'm not speaking poorly against anybody. I'm just speaking the truth. We saw that God told Abraham and Sarah they were gonna have a child, right? They said, well, this is not happening quick enough. If, you, if they honestly, honestly believe that this is their land, then why don't they wait for God to do it? Because something in them has to, to believe that, no, this is something we got to take by force, which means they don't honestly believe that, right? Let's just be honest with ourselves and, and use some of our own logic, okay? Not dispelling what God has said, but some things are just logical. And, and it's like I also mentioned last night, and I don't have time or energy to get into it right now, but we talked about... Are these the same Jewish people that are spoken of in the Bible? That's a whole different discussion. Let's use our logic. But when it comes down to it, right is right and wrong is wrong. And we've got to stand by right. Amen? Imam, what um, can we as Palestine. Uh oh. I'm sorry, my, my, my signal is a little bit bad, but um, what's it called? The, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Um, I said, what can we as different groups and individuals do to help the people I, of Palestine besides obviously yeah. praying for them? Yes, absolutely. No, I appreciate you very much. And I will say, just to add on to the last point that you made, mm -hmm. um, the point that you're bringing to question is a point about epistemology. What epistemology yeah. is, is how do you know whether truth is actually truth? Mm -hmm. how, what is the system in your mind that you use to establish truth from falsehood or uh, real reality from, you know, fake, et cetera. And that, that, that's, that's the work, honestly, to answer your question, it kind of go, comes back full circle. Mm -hmm. That's the work that's required uh, 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 on us to really see, okay, what is the claim? The claim is that this, this was originally, for the Jews, okay, are we talking about the Canaanites? Well, the, first of all, Arabs are Semites, and the Canaanites, Arabs and Jews both have an equal claim to the Canaanites. It, it, no, no one has more of a claim than the other. Uh, uh, and is that the issue we're really talking about when we're when we're uh, you know funding a regime that is murdering and occupying and expanding settlements that that, that the UN is against and the majority of the world is against, except for the United States, etc. So. I would say the best thing for, for, for anybody, any faith leader, any individual to do of functions like this, educational functions, where people are learning more, people are reading more. Again, I, I think you guys should have book clubs with this book. Start with this book. It's a great place to start. The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Elon Pape. 
that's a great place to start. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, just start the conversations there. There's a whole uh, Palestine reading list I can send to you. One, one of, uh, there's a professor in Berkeley College. His name is Dr. Hatim Bazian. Dr. Bazian, B-A-Z-I-A-N. He has a whole reading list that you can go through to educate yourself on Palestine. That's my main thing. Other than praying, educate. educate. Read, confront the biases. Okay, you don't have to take a side. Read from the Zionist, uh, you know, sources as well and, and, and see what, what you feel like. I believe every individual is innately, uh, you know, um, structured in a way to have a proclivity towards the truth. Absolutely. And what, accept it or reject it, that's something God will hold, uh, hold us accountable for. Mm-hmm. Um, I do. I do. I'm sorry. I, I would like to stay longer, but I do have to go as I'm driving right now. And I'm just, it's a long day. And uh, I have another um, uh, commitment that I have to get to. So please do forgive me. But if anything else is needed, I, I'm really hoping, I really enjoyed this. And I'm hoping that this is not the last time and we'll be in touch, hopefully. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. And we will talk to you very soon. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Have a blessed day. You Bye-bye. too. Bye-bye.